Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. What if I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but by just adding something wonderful and affordable to it, you can have your skin looking more even, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, and even smaller pores. Well, Regila Hydrating Serum is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It's perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or prepping for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean, beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating or even the, for even the most sensitive skin. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals and features hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C. This is the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner and moisturizer without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it from Regila's Amazon shop today by clicking the link in the description box. Let the glowing reviews speak for themselves. Reveal your beauty with Regila. Welcome back to season three of Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, and today I have a fabulous guest for you. Her name is Miranda Clark, and she's going to be talking to us about love and relationships. And I am so jazzed about this topic today. I woke up jazzed. So I know that you are in for a treat. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, Miranda. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, thank you for being here. So yeah. I'd like to give you the floor to talk about what it is that you're passionate about and what yeah. led you kind of to this love, like talking about love, relationships, yeah. and working with couples. Yeah. Well, I was in graduate school and going into grad school, I had this thought that, okay, I'm going to work with kids and teens. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be my thing. That's where most of my experience is from. And so doing some of the, the work in the classes and turns out I needed to have a couple of electives. So mm -hmm. I saw this couples therapy course and I knew the professor was amazing. So I was like, ah, oh, why not? <laughs> come to find out. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, this, it totally opened me up at there. A big spark went off. And if someone had come to me in graduate school and said, Miranda, you're going to be working with couples in private practice to be like, no, I'm not. No way, Jose. That sounds terrible. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. It was the only thing that after each you know, class, I was like, yes, this feels right. Mm. So, so I started private practice right after graduation, which was kind of frowned upon. That's a whole nother thing, but I did it part-time. And I realized that after each session, I felt the same way when I was mm. working with a couple, I felt energized. Mm. Whereas if I was working with a teenager or an individual, it may have felt good, but I felt a little bit drained, mm. you know? So then I just continued with that path and I realized that, you know, a lot of these couples are having kids mm -hmm. <laughs> and it seems really stressful. <laughs> I thought, gosh, I would really love to work specifically with couples after having children because marriage and relationships and all of that is such an investment and it's such a, a possible place to heal mm -hmm. from attachment trauma from parents. Why wouldn't you want to hold this so sacred and make sure that it's so strong before having kids? So I down the road discovered, you know, the Gottmans up in Seattle and that they have like a, a training program for bringing baby home to become an educator. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Yes. So long story short, I did the training for that and have now really incorporated that into my practice. And I used to run workshops that was pre-COVID and now I'm tweaking them to do it virtually, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So you are led to have this capacity to help couples and it is so yeah. needed. 
before we started recording, I was telling you how, like in my vision of what we were going to talk about today, the relationship, like you get to get the relationship that you want and it gets to be easy. But that was my soul speaking. My mind was like Mm -hmm. picturing all the times of how hard it was (laughs) before Mm -hmm. you get to the easy. So I would love your thought on that process of why is it that it, like you said, starts off with the butterflies feeling so good, Mm -hmm. but then it gets hard in that messy middle. (laughs) Yeah. I think so much of it has to do with our attachment of how we're raised. I was definitely a people pleaser Mm -hmm. and, you know, getting to a place now where I'm considered to be a former people pleaser (laughs) or in recovery, I'm in recovery. (laughs) Me too. Me too. (laughs) And so is my husband. And we, we have very similar experiences growing up, but I think when we have these preconceived like thoughts, so much of it is like, the stories that we tell ourselves in our head that get in the way of authenticity with our partner. So we are making assumptions, creating these stories, and we don't open up and share those stories or those narratives. I know Brene Brown is really big on talking about like the story that's happening in my head. And I noticed personal example for myself when I was a child and my mom would be upset. She would clean angry clean. I knew in that moment as a child, like, oh shit, she's mad. I did something wrong. I kind of went into this place Mm -hmm. and fast forward to my marriage, you know, soon after getting married, when I noticed my partner would start to clean, I would instantly go back to that place. And I had this story in my head that was like, he's mad at me. I did some, he's upset with me. I I had that with me for Mm -hmm. so long. And then eventually I just said, you know what? There's a story that's happening for me right now that you're upset with me. Is that true? He's like, what? No, that's not true at all. And so it took a while to kind of reprogram Mm -hmm. my physical response to that. So again, like those relationships have the capacity to heal Mm -hmm. some of those wounds, but if we don't open up to allow ourselves to heal, then yeah, relationships are really hard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, That was a beautiful imagery that you journey that you took us on because like you physically, as you were speaking it, I could feel it in my body because our body remembers it. Right. And so it's Mm -hmm. not only the story that we tell ourselves, but our body physically puts us back to that exact moment like almost like frozen in time. So I would Mm -hmm. love for you to tell us any tangible tips that the listener can take away from being able to impact the story, being able to soothe the nervous system, because that is what, Mm -hmm. that is one of the things that gets really like that freeze fright, like you were saying. And so I'd love for you to unpack it a little bit and give us some tangibles. How can we start to unpack this story and how can we soothe our nervous system in the process as well? Yeah. So often when we know that there's something there is when we're in a conversation with our partner and maybe one of us says something and the other person reacts Mm -hmm. and, and we think like, Whoa, where did, where did that come from? If it seems all of a sudden there's a wound there (laughs) and many couples that I work with, when they get to a place where conflict becomes heightened and our heart is beating a hundred beats or more per minute. I actually have the exometers that I would use in session when I was in person. Now I just have people look at their Apple watch or Fitbit or, and so often our heart is beating before we realize Mm. that we're getting triggered. Our heart is beating a hundred more, a hundred beats or more per minute. So in that moment, I try to have them take a break recognize what do you notice in your body? What's Mm -hmm. happening right now? This is the point where we want to take a break, come back after 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And there's always a story. There's always usually a story there of we hear something maybe through a critical lens that is not necessarily true. Either it's from parents or either it's from previous relationships. We still carry these things with us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if we're able to set aside, take a break, then come back and kind of dissect it a little bit. So something that's really helpful too, is thinking about the couple. We are in this pattern. We are in this thing. It's us against the thing. Mm. It's us against this spiral that we find ourselves in. So the more that we can externalize it, the easier it is to feel like you're a team with your partner Mm -hmm. and that we're going to get through this together. Yeah, it's, it doesn't feel very good and I'm hurt and you're hurt, but we're going to get through it together by looking at it outside of us. 
taking that space, but it's hard, it right? Is. Because so often it's when we practice. come back together, we can immediately get back into that place. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, it has to become a practice. It has to almost make it yeah. a game. It almost has yeah. to feel like a game. And as you were speaking, it's almost like disassociating with the problem and the situation, the circumstance, mm-hmm. put it outside of you. And then looking at mm-hmm. it from like another person looking at it is what I was yeah. seeing as you were yeah. speaking, because so many times we take it in and we wear it and we internalize it and make it the circumstance, the situation all about us. So taking mm-hmm. that extra step to disassociate, even for just a moment, and yeah. look at it as a team. I think that is a huge, huge thing yeah. to start practicing. And yes, yeah. it's going to be hard at first, but it's worth worth trying on for mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> yeah. Something else that is really helpful too, is we have a tendency sometimes to say, well, you said this mm-hmm. and it's like, that will open the door for <laughs> more conflicts. <laughs> but what is actually happening is I heard this. Mm -hmm. This is what I heard. This is how I saw you in this moment. It's such a different lens because Mm -hmm. what I heard is not necessarily what was said, but through my experiences and through my own life, I, this is how it interpreted to me and it affected me in this way. So when you say, I heard this, it opens it up for like, okay, that is not my intention of what was said. This is what I was saying. So it opens more opportunity for clarification Mm -hmm. to kind of give each other more secure base Mm -hmm. of, okay, we're safe here. (laughs) Exactly. And even repeating that to yourself, right? We're safe here. Like there is Mm -hmm. no tiger we're fighting against. There is no external force like out to hurt us. Like it's just the moment. It's just the situation. But Mm -hmm. again, it's not a normal thing to do because we're not taught to do this. Yeah. So why is it that our partner is our biggest trigger? Like they are the person who can like push our buttons. They bring Mm -hmm. out so much out of us. Like Mm -hmm. if I think back to some of my nonsense wars, like, ah, it's, it wasn't even about either of us, but we make it about ourselves and they trigger that out of us so much. Like, Mm -hmm. why is that? (laughs) That's an interesting question because it seems that that can occur not only in maybe some toxic relationships, Mm -hmm. but also like really secure, safe relationships as well. And it feels very similar to children who have been like sweet little angels Mm -hmm. at daycare all day. And then the moment that you go and pick them up, it's like a a light has switched, right? Because they're like, oh yes, finally my parent is here and I can be myself and let everything go and all the stuff that I've been holding on to. And, oh, wow. and I'm wondering if that is a similar reaction to what yeah. we have with our partner of like, okay, I know that you are going to be here. I can count on you. Yeah. I'm going to open up myself to you a little bit. You know, my triggers, you know, my history, you know, all of the dirty parts about my life, <laughs> but There's also this other piece too, that we have to think about of where are we at? If we were to take a temperature gauge of our relationship, is it overall like in a positive perspective Mm -hmm. or is it in a negative perspective? Mm -hmm. And if we're in a negative perspective, anything that our partner says, we're going to view through a critical lens. Whereas if we are overall, like we're friendly towards each other, we love each other. We know each other's world. We're meeting each other's bid to connect each Mm -hmm. day. We're going to be in a positive perspective where we're able to kind of let things bounce off. Maybe we're able to to check in about like, Hey, is this what you meant? Cause this is what I heard. So really taking a point of, okay, where am I at in my relationship? Does it feel overall really positive Mm -hmm. or am I just always kind of, I'm seeing all the negative things and like, you're very much into mindset Mm -hmm. as well. And so when we, when we're in that mindset of negative, then that's all we're going to see. We're going to see those attacks. We're going to see that criticism, but like kind of choosing to shift of, okay, I'm going to choose to see the good yeah. in this right now. And it comes back to you saying like, we're teammate, like we're in this together. Mm-hmm. We chose this. We decided mm-hmm. this, like, this is what we truly want at the core. We want a relationship that feels like fire. Yeah. We want that passion. We want that love. So if you focus on that part of it, you're going to get, you're going to see more of it. You're going to highlight mm-hmm. more of the good. And then like you yeah. said, <laughs> then we're going to feel better in our relationship. Mm-hmm. And the question that's coming to my mind to ask is why? Why do we think it's our partner's responsibility to make us happy? Because I thought mm. it, I'm going to raise my hand and be like, come save me <laughs> on uh-huh. a white horse, my prince in yeah. shining armor. So, and I know we're programmed 
but Mm -hmm. (laughs) happily (laughs) ever after yeah every Disney story ends that way or (laughs) yeah so how can we I would love for you to unpack that a little bit for us Mm. so that we can start to realize that our job it's our internal like compass to find our joy and then bring it to our partner but how do we do that (laughs) I'm wondering if that would be like a question that that men would also have mm. too. Like if they would have that same expectation yeah. of what a relationship is well, or if they it's, do. yeah. My husband definitely had a vision for what a wife is. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot to the expectation, you know, and the higher the expectation, then the more room there is for that frustration of letdown in between. And I, I'm not suggesting that we should partner up with somebody with zero expectation, but <laughs> yeah. Of, okay. Well, what is it that I want out of a relationship? Mm-hmm. You know, I think so much of these conversations don't happen early on. What do I expect from my partner? What is it that I, I hope what, what does my partner expect from me? My partner and I, we we're both in therapy. I'm a therapist as well, but like we both go to individual therapy and we expect to always be kind of pushing ourselves and opening up to our own stuff. Yeah. I call it the muck. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's a good, that's a good one. That's a good one. (laughs) But yeah, like I think ultimately it's really that's a lot to put on somebody else to expect them to, to make us happy. And if we're having that be the driving force, then, then we're avoiding something within ourselves possibly that could be getting in the way that that to me tells me there's a lot of avoidance happening. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like I was saying earlier, we see so much of it growing up watching the Disney movies. Yeah. You are this damsel in distress and this Mm -hmm. person comes into your life and kisses you and saves you. And now you are alive. (laughs) You are, Mm -hmm. you are this person. And now you, you just rely on them to bring you that joy and that happiness. And I let that pressure, like I need to make my husband happy, touch my heart and like be brought out into my life. And what I've noticed, I dimmed a lot of me. (laughs) Like I Uh. put a lot of me to bed. I put a lot of me to rest. Mm -hmm. I had to create a whole version of myself as this Josie that is going like that people pleaser (laughs) that Mm -hmm. was going to make my husband happy because his expectation was my wife makes me happy. So Mm -hmm. every day, how can I make my husband happy? Which is a good thing to ask, but not from that place of, I can't bring my whole self to the table. Right. So I would love for you to speak on that a little bit and yeah. And just like your thought on it, your opinion on it. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point, especially when we, that dimness, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like turning the light off on ourselves when there's an, uh, mm, I have a lot of Mm -hmm. thoughts. I'm just trying to put the words together. (laughs) Absolutely. Take your time, take a breath for sure, because it's a lot. It it wasn't just like, like you said, you do your own work. So it wasn't tell we started doing our own work that it's starting to come to light. Like this is exactly what happened. And it wasn't a fault of anyone's, but. Yeah. And humans are such social creatures. So there's a huge primal panic fear Mm -hmm. of this could end. My partner could be dissatisfied with me. My partner could leave me. I think is a really deep seated fear that we all have because we're such social creatures. I mean, what's the worst thing that you can do to somebody in, you know, solitary isolation Mm -hmm. as a punishment? There is this constant, like, I need to make sure that I'm securing my place and my worth in this world and with this relationship. And in doing that, it's, it just, yeah, like you said, it kind of dims who you are as a person. So it's very scary to step into yourself and remain present Yeah, because you have to be vulnerable and not a lot of people like to be vulnerable. Yeah, it's hard. Especially... It's hard to be vulnerable. <laughs> is it going to be received well? How are they going to take yeah. it? Is it like you said, is it going to make them angry? And mm-hmm. like you just said, you shine the light on, we don't want to lose that person. We don't want it to end. So what can we do mm-hmm. to keep it where it is? Mm-hmm. That is just a, that's such a reframe, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with like this idea of love, you know, is that it, it, it's, it comes easy and that it's easily received, Mm -hmm. but it's really a choice, you know, like it's a, it's an action. Mm -hmm. I am choosing each day 
to love my partner. Mm -hmm. And I'm choosing each day to put in those little deposits into Mm -hmm. our emotional bank account. And I want it to be in the green because if it's in the green and then we have conflict, we have so much more to draw from Mm -hmm. than if we're just kind of sailing at fourth full. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. That is such a beautiful way to put it. That is such a a way to gauge it because if you have that overflow of joy and fun and excitement, then when the hard times come, you can better manage it versus when when you're always here at baseline and hard Mm -hmm. times come, then you drop even lower. So that is, that is a great way for us to gauge that for sure. So yeah, as you were saying, love, we think it's going to come easy. It's going to be well-received, but for us women, it's kind of hard to receive that love. Mm. It's hard to actually fully let it in. We say we want it, right? (laughs) We say we want it and we want all of our partner. We want to see them, experience them, all of them, but sometimes it's hard to receive it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that too, especially with a lot of women and I, it's, it's, a curious, it's a curious thing of why is, does it feel uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Does it feel hard to, you know, and I think there's some conditioning there. Like if I had to put a theory, because especially, you know, from a very young age, girls are taught to be nice Mm -hmm. and share and play with others and allow people to make those decisions. And when it comes to us receiving that, it's like, Oh, but you know, I don't know. Like you take it some back. (laughs) Exactly. And I don't know if it's a question of worthiness mm. or if we feel worthy to receive it. Mm. Yeah. Because it takes, it's a lot, it's a lot mm-hmm. to kind of take in. And maybe if we do receive it, then it opens up ourselves for more hurt yeah. down the road, potential yeah. hurt. Yeah. So how can we start to slowly open up to let more love in? Cause what I'm finding is the more love I allowing my partner to give me mm-hmm. the better our relationship gets. Yeah. And It didn't start out that way. Like I was thinking I could only have a little bit of it. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. I'm only allowed just so much because I got to save the rest for everybody else. I don't know (laughs) what the thought is, Mm -hmm. but the more that I'm allowed to, I allow myself to open up to receive his love and his holding and his caring and his support. Yeah. The better he feels as a man, like he feels like a man. And I've noticed the change. I've noticed the growth, but it took me opening up to receive that. Yeah. So I would love to know if you have any thoughts of how we can, because for me, it was a long process. I didn't know what I was doing. I I did not Mm -hmm. know the questions to ask or what to do. It was just the more I worked on myself, the more I noticed this for him. Yeah. I'm curious to ask, how do you know love is being given to you? Like, Mm -hmm. what are some things that like, you know, I am receiving love right now. Like, what does that look like? How does it translate to you? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. How do I know that I'm receiving love? So with my partner, like just those text messages that says like, Mm. you're my queen, (laughs) I'm thinking of you, or it's him coming home with flowers, or it's Today, I looked in the pantry. I was like, oh my gosh, my dog ran out of dog food. I got to go to the store. There's dog food in the pantry. Nice. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow. Like my, he read my mind before I, like he shows me that he knows me. He shows me that he cares without me having to ask for it. It's yeah. so yeah. wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so Yeah. Wonderful. And is it when you were talking about having trouble receiving that in the beginning, mm-hmm. was it more of like a physical reaction? That oh you're yeah, definitely like a physical in the body. That- It was a Mm -hmm. physical in the body. Like you're, I think like when you said worthiness, it definitely is a worthiness. It's a worthiness thing. Like how much love did we receive as a child? Did we allow ourselves to be loved as a child? And when we have the partner, are we going to allow them to love us? So for me, it was definitely a disassociation. Like you can only have so much of it. Like, yeah, yeah save it, share it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know, but it was definitely, it's a body thing. It's definitely like a scarcity. Yeah. Like a scarcity place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not an abundant place at all when you're not allowing that love in because then so many other things are not allowing in as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and so much of the stuff, like couples that I've worked with when I, you know, if they have trouble receiving that so much of it is themselves, you know, Mm -hmm. of how much do they love themselves? Mm -hmm. And I know that may sound a little like cliche, but really knowing who you are, Mm -hmm. knowing that you are worthy, Mm -hmm. knowing that you are 
very much able and encouraged to receive mm-hmm. love. Yeah. And it, it moves that energy and it allows you to kind of open yourself up a little bit more to yeah. your partner. Like it, it's so much of it just goes back to us as individual. Yeah. So doing the work for yourself of learning how to accept yourself, receive mm-hmm. yourself, love yourself. And then you're yeah. opening that place up. Cause that's exactly what happened. I started to be yeah. able to tell myself what I need, feel the sensations mm-hmm. in my body, sit with them, acknowledge them. And slowly but surely through that practice, I am able mm-hmm. to hold more and receive more. So I love yeah. that you're, you're bringing that in there. So with worthiness, do you find that it's a both and on both mm-hmm. sides of couples? Is it the man and the woman? Or is it, do you see it more on the women's side of the receiving? I've definitely seen it on the men's side okay. as well, especially, you know, culture of toxic masculinity mm-hmm. and kind of conditioning boys to not accept certain emotions or feel certain emotions. There's definitely kind of a, a cutoff there. Mm-hmm. That's uncomfortable for them mm-hmm. to open that part of themselves up to yeah. really, to those more vulnerable emotions that us women are kind of allowed to have. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it goes on both ends for sure. Yeah. yeah. So both ends have to be doing the work in order to come together and make the two halves of the whole, right? That's mm-hmm. another question that pops into my head is the two halves of the whole. So we are taught that we are like, we become married and now we uh, are yeah. one. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we are one. There is no yeah. more two. We are one. Yeah. So when we're yeah. both doing the work, we become two halves of that whole which is Mm -hmm. so much more beautiful. Like it just feels better in your body to say that Mm -hmm. (laughs) to me anyway. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely that, that soul, you know, connection, Mm -hmm. but also there's added beauty with incorporating and embracing Mm -hmm. two different people into this, like, look at, look at this look at this awesome thing that we have with the two of us, you know, like, yes, we are one in so many different aspects of our life, but we're also these like two awesome people with Mm. very two different needs and two different ideas. And through all of that, we're kind of tackling this, this world together. And because you don't want to diminish who you are, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of couples that I've worked with where they, they got married, they had kids, the kids grew and left the house. And then all of a sudden they're staring at each other. Like, well, who are you? Mm. I don't know who you are anymore. And I don't know who I am anymore because I've just solely put myself into this relationship and to raising kids that I'm lost. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I've heard that story time and time and time again. And before I even had kids, it was like an intentional, like knowing in my heart that that wasn't what I wanted. And so mm-hmm. I was like, how can we start to, <laughs> how can we start to do this work now? So save us work later on. Right. Mm-hmm. And having it bring it. So now you have this two beautiful souls together, and then you bring a child into <laughs> this, mm-hmm. right? So, <laughs> so mm-hmm. you bring a child into this. And for some people, it makes you tighter. It brings everything yeah. together. It feels full. It feels complete. But for mm-hmm. some other people, it's the opposite. Yeah. And so I yeah. would love for you to, from your experience of working with these newly parents, what is it that helps them through that messy middle of now we have a kid and it's not just mm-hmm. us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you guys were intentional before kids. And I think doing this work, my partner and I were the same way because that was my biggest fear Mm -hmm. because I knew that it was a big stressor. Mm -hmm. And actually two thirds of relationships suffer like a a big decline in relationship satisfaction after having kids. And so Mm -hmm. it's a very, something that's not really talked about, right? We get ready for the nursery. We have the theme, we have the stuff, we have all the, but have we, what are we doing with us? How are we going to, manage ourselves and continue to give appreciation and continue to foster our relationship Mm -hmm. without getting lost in the weeds. Obviously there's some, you know, sleep deprivation is a huge thing, but two, once we have kids, there's this huge shift in us that happens. Like we're not just daughters anymore. We become mothers Mm -hmm. and all of the things that we thought we worked through in our past, like just bubble up again. (laughs) Because now we have kids and we're like, oh gosh, yeah, I, I totally forgot about this. Or now I I'm thinking of things differently. And unfortunately, sometimes our values change with Mm. our partner. So 
really, really making sure that the two of you are sitting down beforehand of these are the values I have. And if things have changed, then talk about it, Mm -hmm. right? It's okay. It is Mm -hmm. okay for values to change. I think people get really scared about that and realizing that we all have the best intentions, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but also to this other piece that, you know, in heterosexual relationships, moms have a tribe. We have a tribe of women that come together and we kind of encircle us. The men often feel a little bit like on the outside of this tribe and feel a little bit left out. And then they tend to fall more into work. These genderized roles start to happen unintentionally, even if you talk about it beforehand of like, no, I want to keep my job. Both of our jobs are important. Both of us do housework. Like it's still unintentionally happens. And that creates a lot of like weirdness in us and a lot of like, just kind of the muck, you know, the muck comes up of like, wait a minute, this is not what we talked about. This is Mm -hmm. not what we signed up for. So being really open to constant (laughs) check-ins. Yeah. So really just be this that communication piece. It's so much. Yeah. Talk about it, bringing Mm -hmm. willing to bring it to the light because a lot of the times staying, you think staying Mm -hmm. quiet and not saying how you feel is not going to upset the person. But what happens is it stays inside of you. And eventually, yeah. whether you like it or not, it's going to come out. Yeah. And you build resentment, you know, and last I checked, resentment is not good for relationships. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and so much of it too, that I've, I've seen throughout the years is that we don't want to bring things up because especially for women, we're afraid that we're going to be seen as a nag. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we also don't want to feel like we're mothering our partners. And so we're like, oh, I'll just do it. Or mm-hmm. I'm not going to bring it up. What's the point? Mm-hmm. But so often I find that once something is brought up in session, the partner most of the time is really supportive mm-hmm. of like, yeah, totally. Why didn't you say something before? Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, it sounds so simple. Like uh, just communicate, right? Communicate. <laughs> but yeah. but it can be hard. <laughs> yes. Earlier you were speaking of about that tribe of like when you become a mom, you get the you reach out to your friends and it's so mm-hmm. easy for us to reach out and say you have a kid, like how did you do it? Like we do, yeah. we do that. I did that. And mm-hmm. for your partner to feel like the outside looking in. So how can we as the women of the house, how can we help with that? Yeah. How have you yeah. found that we could help with that? That's a great question. You know, just sitting down and asking your partner of like, Hey, what do you envision? Mm-hmm. What's important to you? A lot of guys really want to do bath time or really want to bottle feed. If there's breastfeeding, you know, my partner and I did both. Cause that was really important for my partner. He wanted to, to feed our kiddos. So we did breastfeeding and bottle feeding. It was really important for him to teach our kids specific things. And granted that's when they're a little bit older yeah. bedtime was, was helpful. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, it's really important. I want to burp. I want to burp her. I can't oh. feed her, you know, I can't breastfeed her. I can bottle feed, but I really want to burp her. And I want to like do those things. So, so many times guys have envisions of what they Mm -hmm. want to do and be as a father and really honoring that is important. One thing that I've, I've noticed too, is especially if, and it's, it's oftentimes the mom is home with the kids more, you know, they have maternity leave, hopefully. So there's a tendency to have this thought of like, well, I know what the baby wants. I know the best way to diaper her. I know it. (laughs) And if we see our partner doing it differently, we have this urge to be like, well, she doesn't like it that way, or this is easier. This is better. My best suggestion is to just not (laughs) let let the dads do. They could have a way better way than us. Right. Or they can have their own special way or like, mm-hmm. however they do it, it's going to be fine. I promise yeah. you it's going to be fine. <laughs> but mother knows best. I think one of the tips I got at my baby shower was you moms do it better. Anyway, moms always do it better. I was thinking, really, hmm. is that true? Like, cause my mind, I definitely have done some work so I can ask myself these questions, but not everybody who gets that advice would ask that question. Like, is it true that I know best, like my way or no way, you know, it's a lot of pressure. (laughs) It's a lot of pressure to put on yourself too. Yeah, Yeah. it is. So saying like giving your partner the full, full go Mm -hmm. ahead to do it his way and ask you if he needs help. is such a better feeling way of doing things. Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And if we were to take that into like a mindset approach of like a positive mindset approach yeah. of seeing our partner do something that we necessarily wouldn't do, but seeing like, oh gosh, how cool is it that he's like doing this and that he's doing it a different way? Mm-hmm. Like, great. You know, like now we have all these different options. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's such a much more powerful feeling thing and thought and feeling in your body than the opposite for sure. 100%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, you have given us so much goodness. I am like loving this conversation. It's so good. I could talk. I feel like I could talk about this forever. It might be, maybe make my fun is turning into a relationship podcast. No, yeah, <laughs> so much fun. Uh, I would love to really take a little turn for a little bit and talk about you, Miranda. Like yeah. what is it that yeah. brings you joy? What is it that you do mm. in your life? fun. Like what? Like, yeah. what? Bring us into your world for a little while. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So my husband and I are both Pacific Northwest born and raised and something that is in my blood is camping. Like mm. my parents took me camping for the first time when I was two months old and I just, you know, haven't stopped. So I have so much energy out in nature. I feel so much love and so much joy. And so being able to pass that on to my kids mm. has been such like I cry every time we go camping. So I'm like, this is just so beautiful. <laughs> Let's see. I just, I, I like to watch shows. I don't know. In the evening, a little glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. We recently got some kayaks. So we're experimenting with that. And yeah. So I, my, my partner and I are, are doing a podcast, which is a an interesting adventure together. So it's new. We're still kind of figuring it out, but we're excited. And, and more importantly, you know, I've always wanted to do some sort of project with him and, and here we are, we're, we're doing it. And so we'll see how that goes. I think it's another, another avenue for love, right? Another opportunity to love him in a different way. (laughs) Full body. Yes. To that. (laughs) Like, yes. And do you have a name yet for this podcast? Yeah, it's called Love After Lullabies. Mm -hmm. And it is all about the stuff that we've been essentially kind of talking about today. So how has children changed your relationship for Mm -hmm. better or for worse, whether you're, you know, trying to conceive pregnant, experience loss and infertility, Mm -hmm. all of these different experiences change us as a couple. So yeah, I love it that you're doing (laughs) it together and that you are going to bless so many people Mm. with the messages that come through. Are you planning to do this more of a, is it going to be solo episodes with the the two of you? Are you going to have guests on? Yeah. So our vision is that the two of us will be interviewing other couples and everyone has a story and we, I just want stories to be out there, you know, because this isn't something that's really talked about freely of how are the two of you guys doing after having a baby? Like no one asked that question really. So, and then sprinkled in, I'll probably do a couple of solo episodes with some like couples therapy kind of communication tools that, that could be helpful. So that's the vision. I already see it as done in my eyes. And I am so excited for that journey for you. Podcasting has been such a gift that I didn't realize I needed. Nice. Um, yeah. And it's so much fun to connect with people like you and share these stories that can potentially change a person's whole life. Like, mm. Let's just be honest, stories change lives. If we're yeah. able to yeah, put themselves absolutely. in it and can choose a better way. And so mm-hmm. I appreciate you and the work that you're doing and the person that you are and the fact that you came on here and you were so open to share with us today. I would love for you to tell our listeners where they can connect with you, where they can get into your world and even work with you. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a trailer out and then we also have an Instagram for podcasts, which is just love after lullabies. And then I also have my own Instagram, which is Miranda. And a Clark LPC. So through that, you can kind of get in touch with me about, you know, either work and future workshops and, and all that stuff. So wonderful. <laughs> and yeah. I love to give the floor to my listeners as we went through this like fun conversation, all about love and relationship. If there is anything on your heart that you feel called to share, this is your time to have the floor. I think one of the things that is the most challenging that I've noticed is one person in the relationship really wants to do something to improve it. And the other person's like, nah, nah. So if you're the person that's like, no, I don't want to do that. Just think about it. Your relationship is an investment. It's so important. Everyone deserves to have a happy, fulfilling, loving, secure relationship. And it's not going to cause harm. 
<laughs> it can only make it better. Right? <laughs> it can only make it better in that what, when you were speaking that what comes to me is if it ain't broke question mm-hmm. quotations if it ain't broke right. why fix it so can mm-hmm. one person can one person doing the work essentially get to the place of creating a relationship that is the relationship that you want or do you need both people all in I truly believe that you need both people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As disappointing as that may be (laughs) to some listeners, it's just, you've got, I'm trying to think of like a cool metaphor where you've got two moving parts. You've got one that's like doing all this work. It's going to get worn down. It's not going to be as fresh and you know, you're a team. Yeah. It's kind of like the giving tree. That's what I thought. Yes. I never read the I book love the that story. Tree. Oh, <laughs> it makes me cry every time. <laughs> like the apple, the trunk, yes. there's nothing left. Right. That's what the I mean, image oh, I just got as you were yes. saying that. So we need, yeah, we need both people giving mm-hmm. everything they got. And oh, so good. Thank you for this <laughs> conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makewifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.